this week on the Backtable podcast. Also, there is something which has been very important for the development of the Zero team is that you have to take an interest in other people's work. You have to understand how they are working. You have to understand the anesthesiology. Uh, you have to understand the challenges of the anesthesia, knowing what they expect from you during the DLB, for example. You have to understand this to better communicate and to make things quite right in the operating room. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable ENT podcast, where we discuss all things ENT. We bring you the best and brightest in our field with the hope that you can take something from our show to your practice. My name is Gopi Shaw. I'm a pediatric ENT, and I have a really awesome guest today. I have Dr. Briac Thierry. He's a pediatric otolaryngologist practicing at Necker Sick Children Hospital in Paris, France. Dr. Thierry is the leader of the airway program in his department. He's an active member of the International Pediatric Otolaryngology Group, the IPOG, authoring six consensus statements, including guidelines for pediatric tracheostomy decannulation to the management of suprastomal collapse in children. And he is here today to talk to us about the evaluation and management of newborns with Strider. Welcome to Backtable, Priac. Bienvenue à Backtable. <laughs> How are you? Bonjour, Gopi. <laughs> Bonjour. <laughs> Hi, everyone. <laughs> Briac, for our audience um, who may not know you, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your practice? Sure. I've done my practice the European way. <laughs> so, um, you know, it was all in med school in Paris. I've done my residency in Paris and I've done my training in Paris. And um, I've been in the Hôpital Necker for a, long, for a long time right now, which is known for having uh, invented the stethoscope. Oh, wow by René Théophile Yassante Laennec. Wow. wow. Uh, <laughs> ooh la la. And also, ooh la la, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it was also the first hospital to um, perform a, a kidney allotransplantation. Wow. Well, it was a long time ago, but... And uh, now it's a pediatric referral center uh, with uh, plenty of NICU and PICU beds, about 150. And I also insist on the fact that we are in a highly centralized state. So it means we have plenty of referral from all over France. So I work in a national reference center. That's great. Um, before we get into our clinical topic, I just want to say hello to your colleague and partner, Charlotte Zellerier. Um She's a friend and a colleague here, and uh, she's yes. wonderful. Um, and was the reason I, one of the reasons I got to meet you. So um, shout out to Ex Charlotte. Exactly. <laughs> All right. So today we're going to talk about the newborn who presents uh, with Strider. How do they usually present to you? You know, how much of the time do you see these patients in your clinic and how often is a, a consult in the hospital for you? I think most of the time it's in the clinic and they are referred to my consultation from the pediatrician. And uh, in few times they are referred into the hospital and they are in NICU or PICU, but this is not the most frequent time. Well, we are going to talk definitely about uh, Strider and laryngomalacia, and the most frequent is laryngomalacia, so they went to the clinic. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about Strider. You know, we it, there's the big box of noisy breathing. How do you explain it to your trainees or to families? I explain them that the Strider, it's due to the vibration of the, the upper airway of the larynx and the supraglottic uh, structures because you have an obstruction in the upper airway. So this obstruction, it leads to bradypnea. And uh, as it's an obstruction in the cervical area of the airway, it leads to inspiratory bradypnea. So you've, you've got a sound which is inspiratory. And when I try to talk about Strider to the resident, uh, it's a high-pitched tone. And it goes like this, like a... <gasps> <laughs> Something like yep. this. Well, I'm, I'm not an expert about this, but <laughs> that sounds about right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And so, when um, patients and families present to your clinic, or you know, if you see them in consultation, what kinds of questions do you ask them? I try to separate the very simple cases from the difficult one. So, it's do the child has respiratory respiratory sign? Does he have a permanent strider? 
does he have apnea? Does he experience death spell? And so you can, you, you have an idea about the severity of the, of, of the illness. You have to talk about, you have to ask questions about the, the feeling. How does bottle feeding go? How long does it take to take a, a bottle? How many milliliters? And also you have to ask about growth and the weight. And it's very important to have a recent weight. And also you need to have some information about the voice because it's not the same if the child has a voice or he never has one. And also does he make aspiration when he, when he, when he's feeding? Yeah. Do you ever ask symptoms about sleep at all? I mean, it's such a um, sleep in this age group is kind of, I don't know, hard to assess sometimes too. But um, do you find that these kids have uh, noisy breathing or strider in their sleep? What have you found in your practice when it comes to sleep? Well, usually the, the most frequent etiology of, uh, of, of uh, striders that we will find is laryngomalacia. So during sleep, it's in in the mild and uh, in the mod in the moderate cases you don't hear any noise at night but it could be they make some noise but it's randomly but anyway you will need to to know how they how they sleep during night because it's also also a severity sign yeah and so we say laryngomalacia is the most common what other etiologies or other differential do you usually have you know when it comes to the noisy breathing in the newborn plenty <laughs> it's like a box right <laughs> box of chocolates there's lots to choose from yes it's <laughs> plenty so you you will find plenty of disease that can cause some noise well i'm thinking about bilateral vocal fold paralysis congenital laryngeal stenosis tracheal stenosis but also a cyst vellicular cyst a subglottic cyst you can make some noise if you if you have some papillomavirus you have plenty of etiology of obstruction. I mean, any obstruction of the larynx and the upper airway can cause a noise at night. And it's quite difficult for the pediatrician or for the family to differentiate the strider from another noise that appears in an inspiratory phase of the respiration. So plenty of disease. And are you able to differentiate strider due to mild laryngomalacia from other etiologies? Like when you see the, the baby, are there physical signs or the sound? Well, just about the sound, uh, laryngomalacia, the, the strider of the laryngomalacia is quite typical, but it can be difficult to differentiate this sound from, for example, uh, bilateral vocal fold paralysis. It's also a high pitched sound. So I would say, Yes, probably, but in fact, uh, <laughs> I really don't know. But you have some other signs and you have some, your physical examination is going to be quite important also. And definitely you would perform a, f a fibroscopy. And this one is going to make the diagnosis. Before we go to the physical exam and the scope, tell me some of the risk factors. You know, we usually get a good uh, perinatal history, you know, always ask about intubation in the newborn. What else do you think about? You, you have to be uh, very careful about medical history, as you said, prematurity, dysmorphia, genetic syndrome, craniofacial dysmorphia, and also uh, history of intubation before, like uh, in cardiothoracic surgery. These are the, the, the conditions that you need to look for during the, the, the physical examination and during the, your consultation because it, it's going to be important for the history of the child and the diagnosis. Yeah. Tell me about spitting up or GERD reflux. Do you feel like that can be the sole reason? I mean, we know with laryngomalacia and GERD, the relationship is, it's, you know, what came first kind of, right? I think that you have to isolate laryngomalacia from the others at first. And if we are speaking about laryngomalacia, so which is a congenital anomaly of the larynx, then we can speak of the role of uh, reflux. But for the others, I really don't know. But for this one, uh, it has been written, it has been published that maybe reflux as a role in this. I don't know, but uh, it has been told that uh, you should use some medication about this. And I do because uh, I'm not sure about this. And also we have to take uh, this information with uh, caution because we know now that reflux therapy 
can cause some illness after when they are teenager or adult. So we don't prescribe as much as uh, anti-reflux medication that, uh, than, than we did uh, before. No, that's a good way to look at it. So tell me about the physical exam. Um, what are you looking at? And then go ahead and tell me some tricks and tips for the flexible laryngoscopy, because I don't think I appreciated that sometimes it's really hard to get a good view on an infant or neonate until I did my fellowship. We just weren't, you know, in residency, it wasn't, we weren't scoping a ton. And then all of a sudden fellowship, it's like, okay, go see the baby. And I'm like, gosh, I don't know if I got a good view. I don't know if I can tell if the cords are moving. So tell me what your tricks are. And, but tell me first about the exam. Sorry, I jump ahead. <laughs> it's really a, a, a quite simple. Uh, we are going to perform a very simple examination of the child, and we are going to look for signs of congenital anomaly, as we as we talked just before, like syn syndromic sign of uh, micro deletion uh, 20 Q Q11, uh, uh, cardio thoracic anomaly, uh, etc. We are going to look for a severity sign of breathing, like retraction. We are going to look in the oropharynx for a velar anomaly, and after we are going to perform the fibroscopy. And the fibroscopy, it could be challenging. So yes, uh, I've, I've got plenty of tips for this. The, the child has to fast for at least three hours. So you don't have any vomiting issue during uh, the examination. You have to be helped by a nurse. I think it's very important because you need to hold the child and uh, they perform a much better job than the parents do at this time because they are afraid and because the baby is going to cry. And so. You need a nurse and you will perform the fibroscopy by, by the mouse. I think it's uh, definitely the most easy and you you can, by the mouse, you can put a bigger tube, a, big, a bigger scope than in the nose. So you can put a four millimeter uh, scope uh, without any problem in the mouse. And it's quite difficult to put this in the nose of a neonate. You don't need any anesthesia for this because it's not painful. You don't need any uh, gas like uh, nitrous oxide, for example. And then I'm, I'm ready to perform the scope. I make myself quite comfortable, so I raise the table. And also, if I have any suspicion of uh, bilateral vocal fold immobility, and I, and I know that the scope is going gonna, is gonna to last for four or five minutes, I place the, the fibroscope and the camera on my right shoulder. So... I will be comfortable and I, and I wouldn't hurt my arm during the scope. Well, this is just a tip, but uh, you, can, you, you can make the scope much longer if you perform it this way. And then you need to see the vocal folds and you need to see the larynx because this is what you want to perform. So I put with my left hand, I put my little finger, my little finger in the mouse so that the child has some suction on my uh, on my finger and i and i can hold the tip of my scope with my th with my thumb and my uh, index uh, and then i will just look at the larynx and if if it's difficult with my little finger also i can put some extension some neck extension and then i will in the end, see the larynx and uh, what I want to see is the mobility of the vocal fold. Ah, that's a very different way than I have I do it. That's very interesting. I love it. So I don't think I've, my usual go-to is transnasal with a skinny scope. But now I understand why they don't eat for three hours because you're going to go transoral. But with a larger scope, you're going to see more. That's pretty cool. And then you don't have to worry about nosebleeds or if the baby has coital atresia, piriform stenosis, whatever. It's okay because you're going through the mouth and then does the pinky kind of help pull the tongue out a little bit too? Or do you ever, you know, when you're, when the pinky is in the, the little finger is in the mouth, does that kind of help move the tongue out a little bit? I mean, everything's so tiny. Maybe the tongue doesn't really get in the way. I, I think if, if the child is having some suction uh, on your uh, little okay. finger, it can help because uh, the, the tongue is, it's not getting out, yeah. but it helps. Ah, Okay. That's really cool. And um, do you normally record all these? Yes. I find it helpful because I can then, I usually record as well. And if it's in the hospital, we use um, an adapter for, for the iPhone so we can record it. And then I like it because you can slow it down. You can slow, when, once you're looking at it, you can slowly watch the cords and see, do they close, open, what's one side doing versus the other? Do you do that? I, I, well, not really. <laughs> I've, got, I've got another tip oh, for this. Oh, okay, tell me. If you have any suspicion of 
immobility of the vocal folds, you can record it. Well, you will record it, but you just need to stay longer. So instead of doing this in one minute, and it doesn't matter. I mean, you, you can, you can perform this for four or five or six minutes. It's, it's so long. Okay. The parents, they, they don't like it. The kid doesn't either, but at some point you will see that the child at first is crying because it doesn't like it. And it's, it's kind of difficult to, to understand if the vocal folds are not moving because of the crying or just because they are not moving. And if you put the examination much longer at some point, they have to relax. Yes. The child relax. It does. It, it's, he's not crying anymore. And then you will see the vocal folds much better and you will see if you've got a movement or not. But you have to accept the fact that it's going to last forever. <laughs> That's a great point because you're right. Usually we're like, okay, let's try to do it as fast. And one to two minutes, It's that seems long. But you're right. The baby's so tense sometimes where they're crying. I'm like, is it that something, the cords are out? Or is it because there's so much tension, they're straining. And then you ha- you're right. You have to give it enough time to exhale, relax, and then see what's actually going on. Yes. And well, there is also something that we could use, but we don't really because, uh, well, not yet, is the um, ultrasonography. Tell me, have you all started using that in your practice, uh, ultrasound? Yes, I do a little bit. Uh, I think it's useful, but we should perform this in all the children. And, and for now, well, it, it was not possible now, but uh, we will. But you can see the movement of the vocal folds. And uh as you're not putting the scope in the mouth, the child is not crying. So he's relaxed at the beginning of the examination. You don't have to wait forever. I, I think this should be the way of performing the, the examination, especially for the mobility of the vocal folds. Well, definitely with the scope, you will also see the epiglottis, you will see the itinoid, you will see the larynx, you will see a cyst, you will see anything that I cannot see with the ultrasonography because I'm not used to it at this point, but uh, I think it, it, it should be an exam. Um, a tool. Yes, a tool that we should use yeah. more often. Yeah, that's cool. Is there ever any role of other imaging? Like, do you ever get x-rays, airway films, airway fluoroscopy, anything like that in your practice? Well, it has been uh, uh, in the IPOG about laryngomalacia. There is an x-ray in the flow, in the, in the diagram. In the, well, we don't use it. We don't need X-ray because the patient has a strider, then you will perform the fibroscopy and you will see. And if you have any suspicion, I think the X-ray is not the first exam that we should do. But I, I'm sorry not to to agree with the iPod. <laughs> no, I, I agree. And I, I don't really have a, a role of airway fluoroscopy or neck X-rays for, for this particular reason either. I did use the iPod, the IPOG guidelines for laryngeal malacia actually to help me study for our complex pediatric Odo boards that just started about uh, three years ago. And so they're very helpful, just as a side note for any of our, our listeners or audience. And I think it's very helpful either way because the algorithms, the flow sheet chart for just managing, you know, when these babies come to your clinic, whether you're uber academic peds or, you know, a general uh, otolaryngologist in the community, you're going to see these babies. And so it's nice to have some directions because you might see these all the time or this, this might be once in every couple of months, depending on your practice. So It's very helpful anyway, but about X-ray, I'm not yeah. sure. <laughs> so, okay. So let's say this is the baby that's in your clinic. And at what point do you consider observation? When do you start considering trying reflux management? Or when are you like, hey, we need to do something in the OR for this baby? There is something that we should emphasize a little bit before this, that you've got a strider, this patient has a strider, and then you have to consider that it's just a laryngomalacia and not something else. And this is very important because usually, well, uh, in, uh, I don't know, 75% of the case, it would be, uh, it would be indeed a laryngomalacia. Then you've got this patient, you perform the fibroscopy, you want to see a sign of obstruction, which is uh, corresponding to laryngomalacia. So you, you want to see the collapsus of the supraglottic structure, and you want to see also the mobility of the vocal folds. And then, and, and only then, you will say, it's a laryngomalacia, and I will take care of it like a laryngomalacia. But until you don't have all these points, you are not sure, and you don't know. 
Well, then, if it's a laryngomalacia and you don't have any uh, repercussion of the laryngomalacia, you will call it. And I think the IPOG at this point is very useful because it helps you characterizing the laryngomalacia. You will have the, the, the mild, the moderate and the severe, depending on the repercussion of the laryngomalacia. So on the first one, you don't have anything. I mean, the patient has a strider and it's just isolated. And the, the, the baby doesn't have any repercussion on the feeling and it doesn't have any repercussion on the breathing. So, okay, you can see for this kind of strider, I don't see them after. I just tell them, okay, you can, uh, the child need to have a follow up by the pediatrician, but I'm not the, the person you want to see anymore. And then you have the moderate. If you have any uh, respiratory sign or Uh, feeding repercussion, and then you will first do the medical treatment. So for the babies that are mild, if I'm seeing them early, like within the first two, three months, under three months of age, I used to see them in follow-up because I thought laryngomalacia could get a little worse, right? Between three to six months or the other thought, the other reason is because I would worry maybe I need to check their weight in a couple of weeks or you know, if something changes. So I always did. Am I being too, like, cautious? I think that you may not be the specialist that they want to see. I mean, you just need to check the weight and the growth. And maybe this is not your work. You're right. Because, yeah. well, at that next visit, I'm not rescoping. I'm not, you know what I mean? If they look good, nope. sound good, it's a it's a counseling session. It's just, oh, and a pat on the back. Good job, parents. And exactly. Yeah, that's interesting. So, the, yeah, you're right. So who, who so, what's it for? That's interesting. Yeah, so, exactly. So I don't see them after. And if something happens, uh, well, of course, they will come. They're going to call you. Exactly. <laughs> But I don't do a systematic consultation after the first one if I don't see any gravity sign. Yeah, that's cool. Okay. For the moderate laryngomalacia baby, so let's say there is some concern. What, well, we'll first define, tell me a little bit about moderate. What puts them in that category? versus, you know, mild or severe? They will have uh, feeding difficulties. I think this is the first. And maybe they will have some, uh, the, st the strider, it, 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 it can be permanent. Well, they don't have any pose uh, during the day. They will have this, this strider. Well, you know. So I think the, the, the most important is if the feeding difficulties, but they grow. I mean, they don't have gross repercussion because of the feeding difficulties. It's just the, uh, The bottle feeding takes more than 30 minutes. And uh, I, I think 30 minutes is a threshold that you can have in mind. It's quite simple. So I will perform feeding strategies and uh, acid suppression and uh, anti-reflux management. And that's all. And I will see them in consultation like two or three weeks after to see if it's still okay. There is something that we didn't talk about is the physiology of the breathing of the neonates. And in the end of the first months, they increase the volume of air that they need. And so they can have a decompensation of the laryngomalacia or any obstruction to tell, to speak the truth at this point. So I may have a, a more intense follow up if I see them at uh, the first week and I, I will see them after this uh, physiology increase of uh, respiration need. That makes sense. I'm glad you made that point. In terms of the moderate lingomalacia uh, babies, do you prefer, do you prescribe a H2 blocker or a PPI? Like, do you have a preference? Yes, I have a preference. I use a PPI, and uh, I will just the slightest dose needed, so one milligram per kilo. And also, I keep in mind that I don't want to keep this treatment for years. And this is very important because it has been proved that if you take some this kind of medication for years, then you will have a, a, a risk, an increased risk of uh, inflammatory disease in adulthood. So it's important to keep this quite short. So maybe weeks, maybe months, but I have a consultation to stop the PPI, always. So like four to six weeks or how long do you keep them on it for, you think? Well, it depends. Uh, yes, probably, uh, I don't know, maybe three months. But we don't have any proof of this. So it's kind of difficult to be reasonable. But well, 
there is something which is important. You don't want to keep this forever. And when you say it's time to stop the PPI, do you taper it? Do you wean it down or can they just stop it? No, I I just stop it. Okay. And then you'd mentioned some feeding strategies. Is that like thickener? What are some of the feeding? Yes. Yes. Thickener. And is... Do you tell them this or does the speech and language pathologist, like the feeding, the, you know, is there an evaluation or tell me about that? I, no, no, no. Uh, I'm, I'm performing the, the prescription myself. So I just prescribe them to put some thickener in the bottle. And if they are breastfeeding, they can extract the milk, then put some thickener into the milk. And for these kids, uh, what's your threshold for getting a swallow study? Yes, if they have some aspiration. All right. So now let's say the baby comes back to you. Let's say you tried a PPI. That was like, let's say um, we saw the baby at two weeks. You did the PPI, some thickener. They come back to you. Now they're about four to six weeks in age. And the family's like, you know, it's the same or worse. And the weight hasn't caught up. Now we're losing weight. And at this point, um, are you thinking about a DLB? Yes. In fact, if you have a repercussion on the weight, then you change and it's not moderate, it would be severe or it would be a failure of the treatment of the moderate uh, laryngomalacia. But then you need to perform some DLB because you want two things. You want to confirm that it's an isolated laryngomalacia. So you don't have any other findings in the airway. You don't have any subglottic stenosis. You don't have any tracheal stenosis, anything like this. And also, you will perform the treatment during the DLB. Yeah, I mean, you know, the secondary lesions with laryngomalacia, isn't it like 20%? I mean, it's a pretty high, there's a large group of kids where all it is is isolated, but there's still a chunk of kids where there's a high association with secondary lesions. And so... Yes, and it's very important to perform the DLB for this point because you want to check the airway and, and you want to well, you, you want to treat the laryngomalacia, but also you can treat other lesions at the same time. So tell me about your setup for a DLB and, you know, how you like to do your direct laryngoscopy, bronchoscopies. So as I said, you have to, uh, you need to have a plan at first when you're performing a DLB. So you have a diagnosis first, and then you will have the treatment. So I have, well, a few, few tips to perform the endoscopy. And I think it, it, it can make the difference. And recently we changed our uh, checklists. We have a special checklist for endoscopy and it helps pretty much the, the nurse and the anesthesiologist because we are talking about different scenarios during the, during the DLB and it helps when it happens. I use uh, Thrive. We, we, well, this tool, it has been a game changer for the last uh, four years. And it's completely different now that we have Thrive than before. What it, what is the what is Thrive? What does that stand for? It stands for transnasal humidified rapid insufflation ventilatory exchange. It's a very difficult name just to say you are going to put some air impression in the nose, and you have like two nasal cannulas uh-huh. probes, yes, uh, in the nose, and you will you know, throw some air into the nose of the child and it's a wonderful tool. Ah, okay. I tend to um, use an ET tube on the side, either attached to the suspension laryngoscope, the Parsons, or sometimes I'll just hold it. Tell me, is that is that basically what it is? But this way it's nasal cannula, so it's kind of not an extra thing to hold in your hand. You don't have anything to hold in your hand because it's uh, on the, the face of the child. And uh, before, we use exactly what you've uh, described. And Thrive, it's much better. You don't have any desaturation anymore. I mean, you have an apneic ventilation. Even if the child doesn't have his... Um, well, you're supposed to perform the endoscopy under uh, spontaneous ventilation. But if at some point the child doesn't have any ventilation, you can last the apneic ventilation for pretty long. Like, I mean one minute, one minute and a half, without any problem, without any desaturation. It's definitely wonderful. Well, I recommend it. It's something I need to change, okay. And well, this this is an important tip. And uh, also, uh, I used to prepare the local anesthesia of the glottic plan before, uh, according to the weight of the child. I used to 
have some uncuffed uh, intubation probe prepared so that if I have some problem, I already have the, the disposal. E the ET tube, the endotracheal tube? The ET tube, yes. And I'll try to communicate with the anesthesiology team quite a lot to make them understand. And there is something very useful also is that I have plenty of screens in the OR so they can see what I see. And this is very useful. And then, well, uh, after it's just an endoscopy, so I'm doing it. I try to perform this uh, very systematically. So I will check the larynx. I will check the subglottic area. I will check the trachea. I will check the trachea for tracheoesophageal fistula. I will check the larynx for cleft. And then when everything is checked, I will perform the, the treatment. When you check for the cleft, are you just using a laryngeal right angle? Like the, the little laryngeal hockey stick or the, the hook? Or what do you like to, how do you check it usually? I, I, I don't have this, uh, this device, but I use a, a kind of a forceps. So I, I, I'm, I put some pressure into one of the vocal folds to, to spread the interarytenoid region and to see if there is a notch, if there is a depression, which is the definition of the cleft. But I, I don't have this. But anyway, you can perform it with, pretty much whatever you have. And then any tips or tricks for sizing the airway? I mean, I know we have like the uncuffed endotracheal tubes, you know, um, and we have the camera in and it's attached and anesthesia gives them some positive pressure. We check for bubbles. Is that kind of the same way that you do it? Exactly. And you are supposed to have pressure while doing this, uh, checking for the bubble, which is uh, 20 centimeters of water. Well, like everyone, I... I don't have any tips for this. <laughs> Let's say that it is laryngomalacia. Let's say that the rest of the airway looks okay. How do you, do you do your super glottoplasty? Do you like powered instruments? Do you like laser? Do you like cold technique? What, what is your technique? What do you like to do? We used to have plenty of laser in the airway and uh, we don't anymore. So I, I like to first, no, there is something which is important before. Uh, when you perform the fibroscopy in the consultation, you will have the type of the laryngomalacia. And there is a clinical uh, classification that has been uh, proposed by uh, Olney, well, it was a few years ago. And um, you can identify the region of the larynx uh, which are the most impacted uh, by laryngomalacia. So it can be uh, the mucosa of the arytenoid, which, which are going into the airway. It can be the aryepiglottic folds with, which are short, or it could be the epiglottis, which is falling into the airway. And I think it's the first thing is to have the classification and to identify which region of the larynx is uh, ill so that you can perform the good treatment. And then, well, uh, if I need to uh, take out some uh, redundant mucosa of the retinoids, I definitely will use cold uh, scissors. I don't use laser anymore because I think it can burn because you it's quite a powerful tool, the laser. So, well, I think scissors is a, a, a good one. You, you just uh, take the mucosa away. You can cut the, the aripiglitic folds quite easily with uh, scissors. And if I want to perform an epiglottoplasty, I will use a bipolar, which is much more simple to use than the laser. Yeah, that makes sense. And, you know, do you uh, usually keep these babies intubated, extubated? Does it depend on how old they are? What's your, what's your po post-op course? It, well, it, it depends on how the anesthesia is going. So you, you need to perform at first the, the examination of the entire airway. So if it's possible, I insist that they have a spontaneous ventilation. Well, and, well, most of the case, uh, it's possible. And if you have any problem, it's very easy uh, to uh, put a tube and to perform the supraglottoplasty in this case, because it's, you are not going under the vocal fold and in the trachea. So I used to perform it under general, under uh, spontaneous ventilation. I used to, wake up the child in the OR without any tube and, well, without uh, need for a tube. If it's needed, you still can perform the, the treatment that you want to perform. Yeah. 
Yeah, my usually, unless they're super young, which is not common, but I think it's very similar where usually without a tube and hopefully by the end of the case, we can send them, uh, they're breathing spontaneously and they're doing okay. We're going to switch gears for a second. Let's say the laryngomalacia is very mild. And let's say actually when you size the airway, you know, let's say it's subglottic, there's some subglottic stenosis. Tell me what you do in that situation. If the laryngomalacia is mild, I will say that I won't perform a DLB. That you won't? Yes. In case of uh, mild laryngomalacia. Oh, I meaning uh, symptomatically, they have more symptoms than what your scope looks like. And you feel like, okay, there's ah. a secondary lesion or, hey, there might be something else going on. Like they're symptomatic, yes. but your exam, some, and that happens a lot too. This is very important. If you are looking at a child with a strider and then you perform a fibroscopy and you don't find anything, then there is something and you need to perform a DLB. This is very important because if you're not, well, it means that you didn't understand that something is happening. So you will perform the DLB. And if I found a subglottic stenosis, it means, well, usually that the patient has a medical history and uh, quite often story of intubation. You can perform, well, the diagnosis, quite easy. And uh, you can perform, uh, I do like section and dilatation with balloon. Your section meaning, do you like to use like a cold knife and cutting the scar? Is that? Yes. If it's completely inflammatory, you don't need to perform any section because it won't help. Because it's soft still. Because it's still stuff and because it's plenty of uh, well, inflammation, well, it won't help. You, you can have some dilation. You can put some glucocorticoid into the inflammatory region. And then, well, I've got a tips about this. If I see an inflammatory region in the subglottic uh, area, I will inject some glucocorticoid into the, into the lesion. And then I will have some dilatation so that the glucocorticoid that, that you've put into the inflammatory region will spread all over. And then uh, probably I will have the patient intubated for a few days and we will have the extubation in the IQ and then see how it's going. In terms of the steroid injection, is that just for the hard scarred uh, subglottic stenosis or do you also use the steroid injection for the the ones that are soft and inflammatory? No, most of the case uh, we only for the inflammatory. Well, not when it's uh, fibrosis and because it's not useful anymore. And then um, when you do your balloon, do you, how long do you stay inflated for? Is that just how long the baby can ta tolerate or what's your? Yes, pretty much. So it's about one minute usually. But if we can see the desaturation before, then we will stop and then have the intubation. And there is something also. I've got a tip about this. When you perform a DLB, you're the pediatric ENT. You're the one uh, that they call when they are performing a difficult intubation. So in the room, you are the best one to perform the ventilation of this child. So you don't need to be kicked out by the anesthesiologist to perform the ventilation because you are the, the, the most accurate person to perform the intubation. And this is very important. And, uh, well, I, I tell you this because, uh, we changed like, I don't know, like, uh, seven or eight years ago. Bef uh, before this, they, they would perform the, oh, the mask but ventilation with the mask. Yeah. And I think it's not useful. Yeah. Because you're just in front of the baby of the, of the, yeah. yes. Yeah. Plus and I want it, their hands free to bag, to adjust the anesthesia gas, to push whatever medication they need to push. I don't need their, yeah. A hundred percent. It's more helpful when they have that and I'm okay. And if I need help, well, we'll I'll ask. But I agree when the baby, it, it's your airway at that point, if you're performing the DLB, the masking to everything, a hundred percent. When you do a balloon dilation, um, do you just dilate once or do you ever inflate more than once? Is there ever a rule for, for that? Well, usually, usually two or three. Okay. And each time it, it's going to be, it's going to last for 30 seconds to one minute. And after, I think it's not useful. Yeah. What's your routine sort of post-op recommendations or orders? Are these babies on IV steroids, reflux medicine? What do you usually do? Yes, exactly. So if I perform a treatment during a DLB, they will have some nebulized 
corticoid and nebulized uh, epinephrine for the first 12 hours. And they also will have some uh, PPI and, uh, and that's all. And then do you routinely take these babies back for another look in like seven to 10 days? Or how, how do you decide what your follow-up uh, evaluation is? It's clinical. I don't perform it like systematically. I don't schedule another endoscopy, but I look at the child and if it's okay, I won't go to the OR. And if it's not, definitely we'll perform a DLB, but it would be on an emergency setting, not a systematic one. So depending on how they're doing. Yes. So, you know, there's so much we can talk about in terms of other reasons. And I'm going to kind of just go through some other reasons. And I just want you to give me some pearls because I feel like there's so much. Each one of these things could be its own episode. But any tips for managing a molecular cyst? Any tips for that? <laughs> it's probably the most difficult DLB that yeah. you can have. Because the child, when you, when you look at the child in the consultation, okay, he's making some noise, feeling is difficult, but he looks okay. And as soon as he will be sedated, he will just, you know, kick out. He will stop breathing. He's going to obstruct. Yes, completely. And there is nothing you can do about this. So it's all about anticipation. You need to have all the operating room ready for this before he enters the room and you will need to have some uh, scissors, some needle, some suction, some laser, some whatever you want, but it has to be ready. And you definitely need to speak with the anesthesiologist team so that they understand what is going to happen because the child is, is, is looking great. And then you will have a cardiac arrest and you don't want to go this way. And it's all about anticipation. And even with anticipation, it can be difficult because at some point it can be difficult to intubate this kind of child. Well, so uh, for the DLB, I try to have the child sedated and then I will open the cyst, have suction, and then I will intubate with uh, an ETT. And then I will perform the rest of the treatment. But the beginning of this is uh, opening the cyst and suction it and intubate. Yeah, it reminds me of not in a newborn necessarily, but, you know, the three or four year old that's presenting for the first time with papillomas, you know, a big bulky. And it's the same situation where as soon as they, that's it. Yeah. There is something different with papilloma is that the larynx is, you can see the larynx. So it's, it's much easier to have the intubation. With the vacular, with the vesicular cyst, you don't see the vocal folds anymore because you've got this epiglottis and the cyst on the way and you can't see anything. And well, I think it's more tricky. Yeah, that makes sense. Tell me about subglottic cysts. Any tips for subglottic cysts? Well, I think in this case, well, you always have some uh, history of prematurity because I think it's only in this case when you will see a uh, subglottic cyst. And uh, I don't think it's very challenging because you have plenty of way to remove them. And the first one of them is intubation. So if you are in any danger in the operating room, just put a tube and you will, you know, cure <laughs> the disease. So it's, it's kind of easy. And if you have time, uh, you just need to peel off the top of the blister and it will be okay. So I think it's kind of easy. Tell me about tracheal rings. Thoughts on that? Oh, uh, <laughs> I know. Again, that's a whole another two podcasts. I know, but do you, yes. Do you have two hours? <laughs> I want your two minutes of wisdom on tracheal rings. Um, you will have sign. You will have uh, cardiovascular anomalies in in most of the cases, about seventy percent, and it would be a cardiac anomalies or a vascular anomalies such as pulmonary uh, artery sling. If you perform a DLB and you see tracheal rings, don't go through. Because if you go through, you will have some inflammation of the mucosa and you will have the global situation worsening very fast. And then, well, just schedule the slight tracheoplasty. Ah, that's a good tip. Don't, if you see it, you don't necessarily need to go through. I like that. Okay. You, you, you don't have yeah. to go through. I mean, the team of London is probably the only one, uh, we are going through because they have a very, very thin scope and they are used to it and they don't touch the mucosa. 
your two minute pearl on bilateral vocal cord mm-hmm. paralysis. <laughs> okay, two minutes. Two minute pearls. Uh, you do the fibroscopic assessment. You will see that you don't have any movement, and you will check that you don't have any movement for several days. I mean, the diagnosis is not at the first time. It will be in a week or two weeks. So bring them back. Take another look. Well, uh, in fact... Is that what you mean? No. Uh, I mean, if he has really a bilateral vocal fold immobility, probably he's already in the NICU. So I've had one or two that have been outpatient in my clinic. Wow. Yeah. And they've actually done okay. And they grow. Okay. And yeah, I, you know, and some of those, I've, I've actually, I have one that I recall. It was actually a colleague's uh, baby, uh, not an ENT, but another medical provider. And I remember showing the recording to my partners because I wanted to be sure that I had the diagnosis correct. And also because the baby was doing okay, other than being noisy. That's wonderful. Yeah, it, it's not common. I've had maybe one or two in like a 10 year period. And so, but you're right. Majority of the time they're in the NICU and there's yes. respiratory distress or, yeah, yes. it's not, they're not always going to look good. <laughs> so the diagnosis is quite long. In fact, you are going to perform the first fibroscopy and then a week later, a week later, uh, you will have the, the second one. And during this week, probably you will put some uh, non-invasive ventilation yeah. to make them comfortable. And then the logigram that I use, if I confirm that there is a, bi- a bilateral vocal fold immobility, then I will perform a, a cricoid split. And if it's going okay, you don't need anything more, that's okay. If it's a failure, I will perform a tracheostomy because I don't want to touch the larynx because in the bilateral vocal fold immobility, there is some, at some point, some uh, recovery like more than 50%, so you don't want to harm the larynx. So it's a tracheostomy for waiting. And if after the age of two years, you don't have any sign of mobility recovery, then I will perform a laryngoplasty. Tell me about cricoid splits for, you know, what is your threshold or who's a good patient for that surgery for subglottic stenosis? I think that you have two indications for cr- cr- cricoid split. The first one, and I think the better one, is for bilateral vocal fold immobility because the larynx is completely okay. So it's quite easy to perform. And I will perform an anterior posterior uh, cricoid split and dilatation, then intubation for seven days. In, uh, endoscopic, or do you ever do these open? Ah, that's a good question. No, I, I perform it on endoscopic, but if you have some subglottic stenosis, inflammatory one, you can perform also a cricoid split and you can perform it endoscopically. But if you want to perform an anterior posterior, I think it's better to perform it endoscopically. And if you want to perform only the anterior part of the cricoid, then you can perform it open. And I think it's a good indication for very inflammatory larynx. You just want to cut the cartilage and then it seems like the the edema is going out through this incision. And I mean, it works. <laughs> do you ever use cartilage or do you sew anything, tack it open? Um... Uh, well, n- not endoscopically. Uh, when I perform a uh, uh, larynx... When you do it open? Yes, I well, then it would be a laryngoplasty. Uh, but after... I will perform the cricoid split first, and then if it's not uh, doing well, I will perform a, a laryngoplasty, but it would be in different cases. Okay. I mean, not, not at the first time. Well, unless, unless you've got a bilateral vocal fold immobility and you don't have any hope for recovery. Like, I mean, if, uh, he has some surgery for um, esophageal atresia and then he doesn't have any mobility of the vocal folds, maybe you can. Maybe the laryngeal nerve has been cut or also after a cardiothoracic surgery. Then you can perform a, laryngo- tra- a laryngoplasty before the age of two years that I was uh, talking about. So in- cricoid splits, endoscopic, anterior posterior for, you know, our newborns or infants under six months for bilateral vocal cord paralysis, subglottic stenosis. If it's going to be only an anterior split, you might do it open. And then for babies where the core laryngeal or current laryngeal nerve may have been cut from cardiac surgery and you know that there isn't going to, you know, we know that that happened, 
you may go ahead and perform a laryngotracheoplasty uh, under the age of two. In such young age, age groups, I, you know, is there anything else in your practice before? And then we'll talk about indications for a trach or what your threshold is for a tracheostomy, but in the sort of um, under six months age group. We have performed also laryngotracheoplasty for subglottic stenosis before six months, but it's not very frequent. Yeah. So, but yes. So tell me about threshold for tracheostomy, whether it's the initial baby with laryngomalacia or the, you know, subglottic stenosis baby in the NICU. Um, when does that come, when does that come into play? I have never performed tracheostomy <laughs> for laryngomalacia at first. I have, no, <laughs> no. <laughs> That's, and that's probably a good thing. <laughs> I know it's in the IPOG, <laughs> but definitely I do not yeah. agree with this. Well, unless you have plenty of comorbidities. Yeah. Well, this is... The core pulmonale, it, it, like the, the buzzwords yes. that are so rare, fortunately, right? Yes. Yeah. For tracheostomy, there is one threshold which is completely objective. It's a weight. So, I mean, before... Alors, in the US, it's before 2.5 kilos. And in Europe, it would be more three. Before this weight, you don't want to perform tracheostomy because you know it's going to be uh, difficult. Yeah. And then tracheostomy for, for example, for bilateral vocal foley mobility or for uh, subglottic stenosis, it would be after failure of yeah. different endoscopic attempts. Uh, for subglottic stenosis, it would be after three. For uh, cricoid splits, I used to perform dilatation one time after the, the first one and maybe a second one. And if it doesn't work anymore, yeah. I will perform tracheostomy. But I think you don't have to perform too much endoscopic attempts. Tracheostomy is not a failure. I mean, it's also a good treatment and you can perform it. You have the right to. Well, as we start to round it out and wrap things up, Riyak, any final pearls or any other important points that you want to leave our listeners with? Yes, just to say that airway surgery, it could be challenging and uh, it's not that easy because it, you have to develop multiple skills for the airway. You have to talk with the nurse, you have to talk with the anesthesiologist, you have to talk with the intensive care uh, unit, you have to talk with plenty of uh, people in the hospital and you have to develop skills which are surgical and non-surgical skills. And it's very important. You have to be a team leader, you have to anticipate the difficulties, you have to keep calm, you have to uh, communicate uh, simply, you have to, well, you have plenty of uh, non-surgical skills that we are not in Europe prepared to have as a team leader. So this is uh, one of the things which was really important for me when I began the airway uh, team uh, that we have in Necker. And uh, also there is something which has been very important for the development of the, the airway team is that you, you have to take an interest in other people's work. You have to understand how they are working. You have to understand the anesthesiology. Uh, you have to understand the challenges of the anesthesia and uh, knowing what they expect from you during the DLB, for example. And uh, you have to understand this to better communicate and to make things quite right in the operating room. That's a great point, Briac, especially, I mean, it is something that I feel like communication uh, and team building, it's, you know, you're right. One, I don't think we emphasize on teaching it in our programs and two, how to sort of attain that. And, you know, a lot of it is all of a sudden you're out in practice and this is what's going to build it. And you have to kind of figure out sort of how to make it all work and then, you know, you know, how, what help, what works, what does it and sort of, you know, how to kind of put it all together for these complex babies. So that's a great point. I wanted to mention, tell you congratulations because you just finished your thesis. Can you tell us about your thesis? You just submitted it for your PhD. That's huge. Uh, congratulations. Thank you very much. Yes, I've just finished it. I've just finished my, my manuscript and it was, it is about tracheal replacement uh, with a decellularized substitute. And, um, well, I will have my defense in two months. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> well, congratulations. And then, Briak, remind me, you have a YouTube channel for some of your surgical videos. Can you tell our audience or our listeners if, if they ever want to watch your videos? Yes, it is called Voix Aérienne à Necker. Okay, you're going to have to spell that. <laughs> 
I definitely know that there is also an English name for this. So if you, in the YouTube search engine, if you type Airway Necker, you will find the YouTube channel. And uh, I am especially proud of the little videos that we've made to explain the tracheostomy for the parents. That's awesome. And to explain how to perform the suction, how to change the tracheostomy, uh, how to take care of the stoma, how to perform the suction, how to change the tracheostomy. And it's very, I think it's very important. We also have a, a quite good video on laryngomalacia. That's awesome. So for our listeners, check it out. It is Airway Nakar um, on YouTube. Briak, thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you for uh, sharing your experience and all your wisdom. I think it's a wrap. A bientôt. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Gopi. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at underscore Backtable ENT on Instagram, LinkedIn, or Twitter. Backtable ENT is hosted by Gopi Shaw and Ashley Agan. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Taylor's Version Hess and Yvonne Orvijinsky. Social media and PR by Chi Ding. Administrative support provided by Jimmy Lee Thanks again for listening and see you next week.